California, a land that has long captured the hearts and imaginations of those yearning for a better life, including countless immigrants from around the world. Immigrants from Portugal and their descendants are among those who make up the state's rich cultural tapestry. About 350,000 Californians identify as being of Portuguese descent. Most are from the Azores. Many have settled in cities and towns along the Highway 99 corridor of the Central Valley, a sprawling farming region 450 miles long. Despite the important contributions Portuguese Americans from the Central Valley have made locally and nationally, little is known about them. Azorians had started settling here in the Central Valley in the 1870s. Uh, they started out as sheep herders. Uh, they developed a good reputation for being steady and willing to stay out in the field with sheep. And so uh, they were hired first in these large ranches out by Lamore. And then, of course, they sent letters home and uh, told of the opportunities here. And more of them came and started settling in the area. There were two waves of Portuguese immigration to the United States. The first was in the late 1800s to the 1920s and was made up of individuals and families seeking better opportunities in America. The second wave followed the eruption of the volcano on the island of Fayal in the Azores in 1958. John F. Kennedy, then a senator from Massachusetts, co-sponsored the Azorian Refugee Act, making it possible for almost 5,000 displaced Portuguese citizens to come to the United States. The Family Reunification Act of the 1960s allowed uh, those who had come either at the beginning of the century or those who came uh, post uh, uh, Capolinus volcano in the late 50s to bring forth their families, their siblings, their mom, their dad. Um, and, uh, and that was the last exodus from the 1960s, early 1960s, until basically about 1976 to 1980. When we left our island of Flores, there was no, no electricity at all on the island. There was no running water in any house. Uh, there, was, um, there were no roads, no cars. Uh, my brothers and sisters grew up reading and learning to read by an oil lamp. You know, that, uh, and this is in my lifetime. And uh, it, so life was, was very difficult and challenging. It was just subsistence living. So you had, a, you had a good living in that it's a very fertile place, very green place. There's fish in the ocean and, and things grow year round. Uh, but that's all you had and you were, you were very isolated. And so this, was a, this area here in the San Joaquin Valley was a great area to come to based on it was very similar to what you had in the Azores in terms of fertile land and you could have you know, animals and grow crops. I think we've made some contributions in certain industries more than others and of course in the San Joaquin Valley in agriculture uh, in the dairy industry um, according to all data that has been published throughout the years in the 1970s especially the Portuguese controlled about half of the dairy products that were being manufactured and of course, when they immigrated and they didn't speak the language, the opportunity for them was to all milk cows. So the Portuguese people, whether they were cow people in their homeland, when they got here, they milked cows by hand, and that was their opportunity to get started in, in uh, to get jobs and then to start their own businesses. Well, my dad couldn't speak English, and we pretty much started doing this, the, taking the jobs that, you know, Portuguese immigrants, you know, do or offer to. Um, uh, milking cows, working the dairies, uh, farms, and that's on my dad, you know, it was a big change for him also uh, to take, you know, start working the dairy and, you know, it, he probably did some of that when he was really young uh, in the Azores, uh, but he was, he had to adopt, you know, to that again. I do remember my, my brothers are very involved in, um, you know, helping to milk and feed calves and, um, you know, taking hay, the cattle and all that kind of thing. My father went to milk cows at first. He had never, I don't know that he had touched a cow in the Azores, but he went to milk cows for about three months. 
we all grew up working here on the farm um, from a young age, I don't know exactly when, I, I estimate it somewhere between first grade and third grade maybe, before school, after school, weekends, Saturday, Sunday, summers, um, we worked all the time. And so, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's the story of the immigrant uh, farmer uh, that is so, I think, um, typical from so many of the Azorians who chose to come to the valley uh, with really nothing more than the clothes on their back and a strong work ethic and a willing to uh, do their best. And certainly my grandparents and my parents reflect that, uh, that dream. Language played a role, a very, I mean, still plays an important role. In the beginning, obviously, it was a way for people to communicate with each other. We got together because of the language. It was a way to communicate and to keep the language alive. There was no way to lose the primary language. It was no way. So we kept the language because in the house we always speak Portuguese. My husband didn't speak another language, so we had to speak Portuguese. So my, grand, my parents came over from Azores over here to live with me then afterwards. They didn't speak English either, and my daughters, we kept, and my, it's a habit, my daughters and I, we never, even though I speak English now, my daughters never speak Portuguese, uh, English with, uh, with us, never. It's a habit. So uh, when I was growing up, my mom and dad were very adamant that we were going to continue to speak Portuguese. So at home, we spoke Portuguese. And every day after school, my mom would sit us down at the kitchen table and we had our Portuguese lessons. So she had brought books from the Azores and so we actually had lessons in Portuguese. I kind of like my language. I think, <laughs> I think it's, a, it's a very rich language. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the, Sp the Spanish might be a little bit more... Um, suave, uh, a little bit more uh, romantic because Portuguese is a little bit stronger. Like uh, we say, porta, fecha porta, uh, close the door. Uh, Spanish, cierra la puerta, eh, puerta. Yeah, everything is very soft, very nice, cierra la puerta. Portuguese language radio was um, a very important bond between the communities. And it was our way to connect also to keep on having contact with the language. I'm a firm believer that if we did not have Portuguese language in the uh, programs, radio programs, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and even through the 90s, we would not have folks speaking Portuguese that they speak today. The Portuguese community depended on radio for the news. I used to go to Portugal and go from village to village with a small uh, uh, tape recorder to record messages from the people in Azores to the people here in the United States. In those days there were a lot of dairies and they needed milkers, and they needed uh, uh, people to work the land uh, or, or to take care of the, the dairy. Uh, so I would advertise, not charge, it was free, but this was service to the community, right? A dairyman calls me and, and he, I need a milker, I need a herdsman, I need this, I need a, okay, give me the phone number, eh? and then I go in Portuguese, oh, hey, we need it. I got hundreds, maybe thousands over these years, thousands of jobs, just. Yeah. And sometimes people will pass away and they didn't have the money, I would ask donations, I, we help in everything, not just me, all the other uh, colleagues who, who did uh, that. We, we help people so much. I charge, charge the sponsors for my radio program, but the services to the people were free. But they gave me other service. For instance, they would cook, they would give me soup, they would give me uh, fried fish, uh, linguiça, all these Portuguese things. So it was kind of a mutual exchange. There was a radio program here in Turlock, and, and it's a great story that I learned a lot from. Um, 
and Mr. Mendoza is the one who spoke in the radio. And uh, the name of the program was Franklin Speaking. His name was Frank. I was with my aunt at her house and she had the radio on all the time. And this gentleman is speaking. I said, Tiaudia, who is this man? Oh, he speaks Portuguese very well and he's got a radio program and we all listen to it. And I came from Portugal. You didn't speak in a radio unless you were a professional. I said, Tiaudia, but he doesn't speak well enough to speak in the radio. And she, and she says, well, he speaks very well. He taught me uh, English. To, I got my citizenship papers so I could bring you here. And he speaks very well. So the church was part of, uh, of everyone's upbringing. You were Catholic, and that's just what you were. Yeah, the, the church definitely plays into the heritage, definitely. Uh, big influence. I, I, I've, it would be hard to be Portuguese and not be Catholic and put all the pieces together. I was brought up going to church uh, every Sunday, and, and I brought, we baptized all our kids, and my son still goes. Uh, I don't think my daughters go. See, they already got a little problem. But, but that helps, uh, you know, a base of uh, uh, a foundation of something that you have to believe in. When they came here in, in a land that was different, in a land that had many different religions, uh, mainly Christian, but different denominations other than Catholic, what could you keep that was yours, your faith? My parents thought it was important for me to maintain some Portuguese identity. I had learned to speak Portuguese in my grandmother's paternal grandmother's home. She spoke Portuguese in the home, and um, we would attend Portuguese Holy Ghost celebrations. This idea of celebrating Queen Isabel of Portugal and what she did during a very tough time for Portugal, which was a famine, which, which was she, that she sold the jewels of the crown to feed the poor. This idea that we have a responsibility for our fellow human being, um, in, independently of one's ideology, is, is, is the basis of the Holy Ghost fetish. And if the Zorians ever lose that in California, they lose who they are. You know, I mean, in this culture in the cult that, that you have here in the Valley, it's an interesting uh, micro culture that you have because you still, you have these, these uh, Portuguese halls that are mainly built about, around religious festivals. But, you know, these date back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they're all over the, the Valley here. I mean, nearly every community has one and they're still going today. Some of my best recollections now, even as a teenager, was uh, sitting at the Portuguese festivals underneath a, a shade tree and my dad talking um, with his friends, uh, you know, about uh, things that they missed in the old countries. There's always been an ethnic pride about the Azores and about, um, uh, about those islands. And, um, and I think it's even bigger with those who are of Azorian ancestry than those who are Portuguese. People normally say, I'm Portuguese, but they sometimes will follow up, I'm Portuguese from the Azores, or I'm Portuguese, or I'm from the Zilas, which literally translates from the islands. I go to the Azores every year. I love the Azores, I love Portugal. Um, it's, um, I guess the way I describe it, it's, it's my biological mother gave me life. And I look at America as being my stepmother that opened me with open arms that treated me like one of its own. You know, this small island, so everybody knows everybody. Um, so, and a lot of, especially in our village, people remember us, you know, the, my parents especially. Um, and that was what touched me the most. Um, people still come and came and just hugged us and was like, just saw us yesterday, you know. I've been going since my, that first initial trip about 25 years ago when I first uh, savored the lapish, I'll never forget that, uh, to just about every year going there. My mother had three sisters who never left uh, the islands, so their children uh, basically all stayed there, so a lot of first cousins. I'm in contact with them all the time. I think uh, Portuguese have a very strong um, family commitment and family ties. 
Um, and matter of fact, I've gone back to the Azores several times. My children have gone back. I want to make sure my children go back because I want that family connection. So what I've noticed is um, our friends and family that go back to the old country and actually firsthand witness the culture and the traditions and things, they come back just really excited about the culture. And we even have cousins who their, their kids, who are our kids' ages, come back and they want to learn the language and they want to do everything Portuguese because they've actually gone back and witnessed firsthand. Since we haven't been back there, we kind of have a little bit less of an excitement about the culture than if we had gone back. So someday when we go back, we will probably come back and, you know, be on fire. I am very proud of the Portuguese. I'm very proud of what they have done. Their work, their sense of uh, community, the, the sense of helping. They always want to help someone. I think of being Portuguese as being um, part of one of the pillars that holds me up, I guess. So I think of myself as American. I think of myself as a Californian. I think of myself as a Catholic. I think of myself as a dairyman. I think of myself as Portuguese. So it's, it's not, it's part of that whole structure that holds up my identity. I might just say I'm Portuguese. I don't even say I'm Portuguese American. I might say to somebody, I was born in the Azores, I can be an American citizen. And I'm very proud of that. I mean, I mean, it's just, um, I have the best of both worlds, you know. I was born Portuguese, so it's great, you know, uh, feels great being Portuguese, and here I am, I'm American, this, I'm a citizen of this great country, you know. I have had such a blessed life, and, and really, that is in part to, to the sacrifice that my parents made. I can't imagine leaving a world that you know for a world that you don't know. Thousands of miles, not knowing the language, not knowing what's going to come your way. And why are you doing it? You're doing it for the better life of your children. So um, I just will be eternally uh, forever grateful for, to my parents for giving me the opportunity to live in this wonderful world in between these two worlds um, that I live in. The central question has always come back to me. What would my life have been like if it were not for the incredible courage of my grandparents? to be real risk takers. I mean, we think about how, you know, our country has been so fortunate to have so many risk takers. And my grandparents were a part of those risk takers. I know my life would have been much different um, if, um, if my grandparents had not chose to take that risk and come to the to the new world, to America, to have a better life for themselves and for their children.